Welcome to Church Online. We are so glad you're with us today. If you're our guest watching for the very first time, we are honored you're here. Before we begin today's message, here are some exciting things happening at Cultivate Church. Check in on Facebook. This month, every five check-ins will provide a book to a child in need. Take a moment and fill out your virtual connect card. We would love to know that you are here with us today. We are so excited about our annual Christmas Eve worship experience. We will have a time of worship and traditional candle lighting. Each campus will host beginning at 6 p.m. We are only a few weeks away from our 21 days of prayer and fasting beginning Sunday, January 10th. Go ahead and mark it on your calendar so we can all begin together. The C-Team is the easiest way to serve others. Our C-Team is full of opportunities for you to use your gifts and talents, and it's easy to get involved. Simply visit the address below to complete Roots Online. We can't wait to serve with you. That's all the news for today. If you need more information, let us know on your Connect card. Hello and welcome to week three of our series, Real Christmas. We've been learning biblical principles from some of our favorite uh, Christmas classic movies, and we're so glad that you're part of today's online experience. I want to say, if you're watching as a guest for the very first time, we want to welcome you and thank you for being a part of Cultivate Church Online. If you're local to Cultivate Church, we want to say come and be a part of worship with us in person. We have an incredible time every single Sunday. Uh, throughout this series, we've been able to watch the clips in their entirety where we cannot do that online due to copyright restrictions. Every Christmas is a lot of fun with Little Debbie Cakes around Cultivate Church. It's a Christmas tradition that we are overloaded with Little Debbies and good stuff uh, for fun every single week. So we'd love to invite you to be a part of Cultivate Church in Alabaster, 9 o'clock, 10, 15, 11, 30. In Columbiana, 9 and 10, 15. We can social distance and be safe and come together and worship in an incredible experience in person. But for those of you tuned in online, thank you for being a part of today's experience. In this series, as we're learning biblical principles from uh, our favorite Christmas movies, week one, we talked through the classic Home Alone. Last week, we talked through one of my all-time favorites, Christmas Vacation. And today, we're talking through another favorite, what I would say is a modern Christmas classic, the movie Elf, starring Will Ferrell. Every week, we like to share some fun facts about these movies, and I've got some that I want to share with you about Elf. I, I was really in, um, intrigued. I watched a Netflix special that I thought was incredible about the making of the movie Elf. If you've got Netflix, you might want to go and check that out. Elf was released in 2003. Uh, if you're like me, it's like hard to believe that Elf is 17 years old. I remember the year it came out. I actually went to the theater twice to see it. I thought it was so incredible. I also learned this in preparation for this week. You remember the classic, uh, the movie A Christmas Story, uh, where Ralphie wants a Red Ryder BB gun? Did you know that he's one of the producers of this movie? He's, he's, a, he's a part of the behind the scenes, as well as playing Ming the Elf. The Santa fight scene, we're going to talk about that today. That's one of the best scenes in the entire movie, where Santa comes and they end up getting a fight and they destroy all the decorations in the store. They only had budget enough for one take for that scene. So after everything was destroyed, they didn't have the money to put it all back together. So that whole scene was filmed in one take, which is absolutely phenomenal. I learned this, that Macy's actually declined to have their store featured in the movie. Uh, they didn't want to give away the, some of the secrets about Santa and being in the store, so they just declined to be a part of it. And I would say, Macy's, you are regretting that decision today. Uh, I was a little bummed to find out that Will Ferrell has actually declined the offer for a sequel uh, to the movie Elf. He said, look, he said, I don't want to be that guy that makes a sequel and it doesn't live up to the first one and everybody say you just did it for the money. So we're going to stop at Elf. And so I think it's just an incredible movie with some really great principles 
that I think actually will bring some, some truth out of God's Word today that's going to encourage your life. In this movie, we learn from the very beginning that they have a code of elves. When Elf is growing up and they're telling his story, and if you haven't seen the movie, uh, he's, a, he's a human who was actually adopted into the North Pole. Uh, as a baby, he got mixed up in Santa's bag. He gets taken to the North Pole. They adopt him as an orphan, and he grows up as a human in, a, in an elf world. He doesn't fit in. He's not good at all the things that they're good at, and he has a really difficult time navigating the world of an elf as a human. And he eventually learns that his, his biological father lives in New York City, so the story is that he leaves the, the North Pole, and he goes out on this quest to find his father. But as he's growing up, they actually teach them the code of elves. There's three things that they teach the elves to live by. It's what makes them different. It's what makes their outlook different. It's what makes their attitudes different. And today, I want to talk to you about the code of elves. I want to talk through the three things that they're instructed. And then I want to bring some biblical principles that I believe mirror that. Because for many of us, as we're navigating this season, I believe we've said this every week. It's a difficult season. It's a difficult year. The holidays are so troubling for so many people. The pains and the pressures and the problems, they just mount up. We've got difficult people. We've got different personalities. We've got uh, different places that we have to go. All of these things that we have to navigate. And this year, especially, all of those pressures compiled or compacted on an already extremely difficult year. And so I want to navigate some of these things, some of these three things today that I believe will help us be the different people, will help us mirror the attitude, the personality, and the person of, of Buddy the Elf. We know he was very positive. We know that he had a great outlook. We know that he was easily to encourage other people. So I want to take you through this journey today, through this movie of Elf, bringing out the code of elves and how it will impact your life and mine through the scripture and the lens of God's word. So I want to pray for you before we dive in that God would bless his word today. So Father, I love you. I thank you for every person who's online with me today or who is listening by podcast. I pray that your word would grow us and stretch us and mature us today. I know many people are walking through difficulty in their life today. They're stressed, they're overwhelmed, they're wore out, they're tired. But I know that today, through the power of your word, it's going to encourage them, it's going to stretch them, motivate and help them. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you've got your notes, I want you to check out the very first code of the elves that they're given. And this is it. Number one, they treat every day like Christmas. What an attitude, what an outlook to say, hey, every day is equally as important and we're going to treat it just like Every day is Christmas. In this first scene that we'll watch together, it's one of my absolute favorites. I think it's the, one of the best scenes of the entire movie. Buddy's mistaken as a store employee because he's dressed like an elf. He's told that this is the North Pole, but he knows it's not really the North Pole, and he's passionate about letting them know. His passion actually shows up in basically everything he does. Like when he's asked why he's smiling like that, and he says, smiling's my favorite. He's told to make work his favorite, and he's still happy and excited. He really goes over the top when he hears, Tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., Santa's coming. He screams in excitement and announces, I know him. See, Buddy's treating every day like Christmas. And then he goes over the top. He begins to decorate the store even more than it already is. He works hard building extra props. He decorates with even more Christmas lights and then puts together all these incredibly made, homemade decorations. And all of this is because of his passion and excitement over the arrival of Santa. And his passion is really evident when he realizes Santa isn't the real Santa, and he asks, who the heck are you? I love when he tells the little boy, don't tell him what you want, he's a liar. And then, in a passionate rage, Buddy pulls off Santa's beard, and then an incredible fight breaks out. All of the kids are screaming and watching Santa and an elf completely destroy everything at the North Pole. See, Buddy is so passionate. He's treating every day like it's Christmas. Just like he was instructed, every day is Christmas. Treat it like it is. Your outlook and your attitude is completely determined by what your view of today is going to be. Did you know that this scene in Elf is actually, I think, a mirrored scene out of the Bible? 
I want you to take a look at this scripture with me. I want to show it to you out of John chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. And it says this, It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at a table exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. Check that out. He drove out the sheep and the cattle. He scattered the money changers and the coins all over the floor. He turned over their tables. Verse 16, then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. I want to ask you this question today. What is it that you are passionate about? What is your passion? In this scene that we read from the Bible, see we think of Jesus all the time as just maybe walking through town or floating through town. His feet probably never touched the ground. And he's just blessing babies and he's hugging people and he's shaking hands and he's saying, God bless you. We think of Jesus in that way. But in this scene, he's Buddy the Elf, passionate about what he believes in, and he turned this place upside down. See, people were taking advantage of, of the temple. They were in there doing things that they were not supposed to do. And Jesus' passion rose up. I love that it says, hey, he grabbed and made a whip from some ropes and he chased them out of the temple. Picture that. Jesus grabs some ropes, makes a whip, and chases the people out of the temple. And then the disciples are watching this in complete awe, like we're watching Buddy the Elf roll around with Santa, those kids that are screaming. They're looking at Jesus going, what in the world is happening here? And then they said it. Hey, they remembered a prophecy. It was going to be said that a passion for God's house will consume me. What is it in your life that will make you flip over the tables? What is it that you're passionate about that you're going to chase some people around until something is done or something happens or you achieve something or something moves in your life? What is your passion? In order to treat every day like Christmas, you have to be passionate. And there's so many reasons that many of us today, I believe, may have lost our passion. I do a lot of weddings and I do a lot of pre-marriage counseling before we get to weddings. And there's something that I always think about moving into weddings is that wedding day that everybody's planning for, everybody's paying for, everybody's preparing for. And you feel like a princess and maybe a prince charming and nothing in the world matters on your wedding day. I mean, the whole place could burn down. And as long as you're married at the end of the day, that's what's really important. You're so excited about, about the wedding. You're not really worried about anything else. But then Life has this way of bringing pressures and problems and pains to your relationship. And then maybe you have financial difficulty. You try to get the house and you try to have the two nice cars. And then suddenly you want to bring kids into the picture and they're expensive and they're complicated and it complicates the relationship. And suddenly you're not spending enough time together. Suddenly you're fighting over the mess in the house. Suddenly you're fighting over who's going to do the laundry and who's going to do the dishes. Who's going to drive the kids to soccer practice? How are we going to pay for this? Are we going to save money, spend money? All of these pressures, all of these problems and all of these pains begin to pile up on your relationship. And we forget the main thing. We lose our passion because of all of the problems that are in its place. But what if we just remembered the reason that we stood there on the wedding day to begin with? What if we remembered that moment when nothing else mattered besides our, our life together and our relationship and our love for one another to reignite the passion I believe many of us today have potentially lost our passion in life because we've let the pains and the problems and the pressures replace our passions. And I'm reminding us today, just like Buddy the Elf, let's treat every day like Christmas. How do you get your passion back? I say it this way, the closer we become to the flame, the hotter it gets. The closer you are to the flame, the hotter it gets. In my house, we like to run... Um, 
a fireplace during the holidays, and especially when the tree is up, it's just nice. It's a nice atmosphere, but also when it gets cold, when our temperatures drop in Alabama, which are, you know, they fluctuate every day if you live here. Some days it can be 80 degrees. Some days it'll be 20 degrees, but when it's cold, we like to run the fireplace in our home, and I notice that it gets so warm and so cozy. My little four-year-old would say, Dad, I want to be cozy, and it gets cozy in our living room because it gets so warm to that fire, but when you leave that room, suddenly you start to notice that it gets cold again. And I may go to the other end of the house and get a little colder, and I'll come back. And this time, I'll find myself getting right next to the fire. You ever notice yourself do that? You like to back yourself up as close as you can get to the fire and get yourself warm. Maybe you put your hands out so you'll warm yourself up. See, the closer you get to the flame, the hotter it becomes. And in life, the closer you get to the things that you're passionate about, the hotter it becomes. Maybe our passion for God has has gotten colder because we've gotten farther away from the flame. And today the reminder is treat it like it's Christmas. Treat every day like it matters, like it's a celebration. You know Christmas is a celebration. It's about generosity. It's about selflessness. It's about the greatest miracle that has ever taken place. All of these things that are represented in Christmas are a reminder of what God can do every day in our lives, not just on Christmas. Christmas was so that we could receive the greatest miracle, and that miracle was the birth of Jesus. And so I would say today, check your passion. If you don't feel like every day is Christmas, if you can't follow the code of elves and treat every day like it's Christmas, maybe you need to get closer to your passions. Your daily priorities determine your daily passions. It's a great way to start. Your daily priorities that are in your life determine your daily passions. So the things that you put first, the things that matter, the things that you include above all else. Now, uh, in my daily life, I'm going to include several things. I'm going to include food. I'm going to include work. I'm going to include the gym. I'm going to include time with my family. And typically, before I lay down to go to sleep at night, I'm going to include something on TV. Most of us, we all have things that are going to be in our daily routine. But in the midst of those things, what produces the passion that gives you the potential for all of those other things? Where is God in that day? Where is your time of prayer? Where is your time of worship? Where is your time of devotion in God's Word? I say, let your daily priorities determine your daily passions. And the more passionate you become about the things of God, the more you can treat every day like it's Christmas. It will live out of the overflow of your life. So principle number one from the movie Elf is treat every day like it's Christmas. Let your outlook overflow. Let your joy overflow. The preparation for something great to happen. Let it overflow out of you. Let you be a blessing to other people. Let that flow out of you. Let the the thought of miracles taking place in your life flow out of you because every day is like Christmas. Jesus was passionate about things because his passion for God's house was consuming in his life. Let your passion for the things of God be consuming in your life. And I promise you, it will change everything. Principle number two from the movie Elf is there's room for everyone on the nice list. I love this next scene because this scene is really the heart of the movie. The entire reason Buddy is even in New York is to find his biological father. And in this scene, he shows up to his dad's office, and I love this part because he's just amazed by the elevator. He gets on the inside and he sees that the buttons are lit up. So he begins pushing all of the buttons to light it up like a Christmas tree and talking about how beautiful it is. I love the reaction of the guy in the elevator with him. And then he finds his way to the office of his long lost dad and he screams just that, Dad! And everyone in the office is confused by what's happening, obviously. But initially thinking this is a singing telegram. I mean, they're thinking this guy's just here to sing a song. But they expect a song and a dance, maybe a Merry Christmas, and that's all. But Buddy is passionate about reconnecting with his dad. The whole scene turns out to be different. 
This scene doesn't give the happy ending, though, that Buddy's looking for. Instead of reuniting with his father, he's thrown out of the building as if he's a crazy person. And, of course, it's completely understandable to see why they would think that. However, where many of us, we might would give up, we might would get angry, we may feel hurt or rejected, Buddy responds differently. See, he believes there's room for everyone on the nice list. He actually sends a gift written to someone special. He includes a card that says, Dad, and sure the gift is weird, but at least Buddy is trying his best. See, in this scene, there's room for everyone on the nice list. See, Buddy goes and his heart is just is so passionate about reconnecting with his biological father. It doesn't go the way he thinks it's going to go. He's actually thrown out of the entire building. He doesn't get this happy ending. But his attitude doesn't change because he believes in people. See, even in the difficulty of relationships and what is given to him, because he treats every day like Christmas, he still believes that there's room for everyone on the nice list. So his response is very different than what most of our response would be. Most of us don't send gifts to people who mistreat us. But he spends his time getting a gift that he thinks is special for a special someone and sends it to his father. Look at this scripture with me in Romans 5 and 8. It says, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think for many of us, navigating difficulties in relationships, and we touched on this last week as well, but as you're trying to live this out, we have to first go internal. Most of us like to begin with the external. It's a lot easier, if I'm honest, to tell you everything that's wrong with you. I can pick out all of the things that I see that you can maybe tweak or change to make better about yourself. It's easier from the outside looking in to determine how things need to be rearranged or or renovated so that they're better in your relationships. But when it comes to me, I have blind spots. I don't see everything maybe as clearly as you could see into my life. I don't see all of my faults and failures as well as maybe you see my faults and my failures. My wife tells me all the time, it's not what you say, but it's just how you say it. It's that tone of voice. It's that look on your face. And for some reason, it's like I'm tone deaf to that. I can't necessarily hear it, and maybe I can't even see it. But my wife can see something in me to help correct it. And so I want to challenge you today that while we were still sinners, while we weren't even worthy of it, Christ died for us. And so maybe let's just begin our outlook of what we see in others by taking a look at ourselves. Let's take a look at our own faults, our own failures, our own shortcomings, and see what can I do to correct some things in me internally so that will flow in my relationships externally. And then the Bible gives us some hints on what we can do to help in our outlook in other people. In Colossians 3.13, it says this, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive. That's a tough word. Make allowance for each other and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord had forgiven you. Hey, He forgave you, so you must forgive others. This is a really tough verse of Scripture. Forgiveness is a tough thing. And I love that the Bible says make allowance for each other. An allowance is a determined amount. It is an amount that has been determined in which you will share, how much you will give. It's the amount of margin you have for something. And so the Bible says to make allowance, already know that you are going to need forgiveness and already know that you are going to need to forgive. It's a give and take. Make allowances for each other's faults, not just your own and not just for them. It's a two-way street. We all get it wrong sometimes in relationships. There is no relationship without two people. It takes more than one person to have a relationship. So you have to make allowances for it. And then the Bible just clearly says, and forgive anyone. Anyone is anyone who forgives you. And or offends you. And remember the Lord forgave you, because this is important, so you must forgive other people. We need to forgive because you will need to be forgiven. Why do I need to forgive them? Why do they deserve it? Why should I forgive them? Because you're going to need to be forgiven. Forgiveness provides freedom. Forgiveness in your life will set you free. 
I believe that today some of us are under a really heavy weight of some offenses that other people have caused us. And you need to forgive them, not just for the sake of them, but for the sake of you. Because you need to be set free and you need to find freedom in your life. And there are some people that you have offended and you have brought offense against and you need to go and ask for forgiveness. And no matter what you think about any of those people, there is room for everyone on the nice list. Listen, learn to forgive. There's a little three-step thing that I think is so true in learning to forgive yourself, to forgive others, or to be able to go to somebody and ask for forgiveness. And the first step is to forgive through prayer. Pray and ask God to do exactly what we talked about. Search me, get me, get me cleaned up, get me fixed, get me situated first. Whatever's wrong with me, God, I know that I was a sinner and I missed it and you still love me anyway. So, so I'm going to pray, God, that you help me be prepared for them. And then pray with words. Begin to speak kindness. Begin to speak positive. Begin to speak things that are life-giving about those people who have hurt you. Find the things that are positive. When you speak curses, you set the whole atmosphere and you'll never overcome it as long as you're speaking it. So, so forgive through words. And then the third thing I would say is, is forgive through action. At some moment, you need to go to that person. You need to bless that person. You need to speak forgiveness to that person. You're not responsible for their response to you. You're only responsible for what you bring to that relationship. So there is room for everybody on the nice list. Don't wait for emotion. Start with action. Emotion will follow. Don't wait on the emotion to come. Start with the action, and the emotion will follow. These principles are what God's buddy the elf. That's why his attitude is so good. And I believe that's really who God wants us to be. I believe that's really a great picture of what God would love to see through your life and through mine. We need to treat every day like it's Christmas. We need to remember that there's room for everybody on the nice list. God always provides forgiveness. He always provides grace. He always provides mercy. He always provides patience for us. And he wants to us to extend that to other people. And the number three, here's the third principle of the elves, is the best way to spend Christmas cheer is to sing loud for all to hear. In this final scene, it really brings the entire movie to completion. In this scene, it's a Christmas Eve and Santa's trying to deliver all the presents, but his sleigh just refuses to fly. He crashes in Central Park just because of the lack of Christmas spirit. People have stopped believing and and the miracle of Christmas can no longer happen. There's no faith in Christmas and there's no belief that Santa is real and people have given up. But then everyone remembers the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. Then everyone in the park is led in a Christmas song. And then we see scene from scene that people all over begin joining in and singing together. And then this leads to Christmas spirit and the faith to begin to rise. And as a result, Santa's sleigh can fly once again, and then Christmas is saved. All of this is the result of one person's influence through Buddy the Elf. Think of the impact that he's made through every scene of this movie, through his positivity, through his outlook, through his persistence, through just treating every day like it's Christmas, believing that there's room for everyone on the nice list, and then... It's all about spreading the Christmas joy. And because of that, the life he lived was a legacy life. Even when Buddy wasn't there, the impact of the life he lived made a standing impression so that people could recall what to do in a difficult time. I want you to look at this scripture with me in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. It says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead... A lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You see, your life tells a story without even speaking a word. Your life is is communicating something every day with the actions that you take and even the words that you speak the way you treat people, the way you respond in circumstances, the way you handle pressure, 
the way you navigate the difficulties or the wins or the losses, all of the things that we do in life, people are watching the way you live. And the Bible says that, that our lives, hey, we're like a light, we're like a city, we're like on a hill where everything can be seen. So that people are watching the way that we respond and the way that we live. And God's Word so clearly gives us, equips us with such information, with such wisdom, to be able to how to walk out and live a life that represents Christ. And I want to encourage you today that the best way to spread Christmas cheer, sing loud for all to hear. Let your life be a song that everyone hears. Make a difference in someone's life this season. Don't take it for granted that they just know. Don't take it for granted that, that they are already a, a believer or that they already know Christ or they already know the true hope of the world. Never take it for granted. When we look at every day as an opportunity to make a difference, that every day is a new day on this planet, that it's, a, that it's a gift from God, and that we have a purpose, and we have a reason for being here. And when we see people the way God sees people, that He hasn't lost hope in them, that He is still hoping that they would reconnect in relationship with Him. And then we understand that we're here for a purpose and for our life to matter, and for other people to see Jesus through us, and that God is using you and me to make a difference in the lives around us, to help increase or elevate elevate the faith of the things that God can do. So today as we take these lessons through Buddy the Elf, I just pray that maybe your life has been impacted today to help you learn to navigate some of the difficulties that you're in, change your outlook on today. We have today. It is a blessing. We just have to navigate today and allow God's help to help us I hope today you've been encouraged about the way that you see other people, that you see the hope in them that God sees in them, the same hope that God sees in you. And then remember, you have a purpose. You're here for a reason. You're here to make a difference in the lives of other people. And so I want to pray for us today that God would help us live that out. But maybe you're here and you just need God to help speak to your heart today because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. I want to pray for you that God would give you this moment to say yes. The greatest opportunity you've ever had is to say yes to a relationship with Jesus. So Father, right now for all of my friends who are watching, I pray if there's one person who does not have a relationship with you, that today would be that day. Father, we know that we've, we've sinned, we've messed up, we've fallen short, we've missed it. But today we just ask you to come into our hearts. We ask you for your forgiveness, and we choose Jesus to put you first in our life. I pray for every person today that is just struggling, God, this season. For every day that has maybe given up on the hope of today, who's lost faith in people that are around them, who have given up on their purpose and their passion to live it out and to live a legacy life. God, remind us today that what we do matters. We thank you for the way that you love us, God, and the way that you help us, and the way that you can lift us when we cannot lift ourselves. I thank you for all of my friends watching, for all of my friends listening, and I pray blessing on them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you said yes to Jesus today, we would love to celebrate with you. Let us know by filling out your Connect card, sending us an email, or clicking the link at Church Online. Before we go, we're going to enter into a time of giving. If you are a guest, this is not for you. This is only for those of us who call Cultivate Church home. There are some easy ways to give on your screen. Because of your generosity, we were able to help provide Christmas for hundreds of kids in Juarez, Mexico. Your generosity reaches far beyond Shelby County. Don't forget to join us for Christmas Eve at 6 p.m. at either campus. It's going to be a great night of worship and celebration. Once again, thanks for joining us for Church Online. Have a great week.